For the Perugia um, program with the School of Data uh, run by the Open Knowledge Foundation and um, um, European Journalism Center, I see some faces that were here yesterday. Um, today it's Gregor Eich again, our graphic editor at the New York Times, who's going to be talking on 3D uh, charts and word clouds. Um, essentially, I guess it's about uh, breaking the rules once you know the rules, right? One final thing for housekeeping. Uh, I was notified that there is uh, the big keynote at 12 o'clock uh, um, up on, on the other side of the city. So we might be sh finishing a little bit earlier to give you guys a chance to switch over if you want to do that, like a quarter to. So Gregor will be around if you have questions. Uh, there will be other days to do that as well. Okay, so have fun. Thank you. So yeah, hi. Um, it's so nice to be here again um, in Perugia. I was here in, in 2013 um, at the very same room and I was holding a session of how to make good graphics or uh, more precisely how to avoid making bad graphics. Um, so I was giving like all kinds of advice like don't cut the bar charts and all this stuff. That we, some of this we, we covered yesterday. And, and one, one of the first slides I had was this one. Um, I told the audience to avoid 3D charts at all costs. Um, and I even literally burned 3D charts in the presentation. Um, so um, a lot of th happened since then. Um, in 2014, I got a job at the New York Times graphics department. Um, yeah, we're this team of fo about 40 editors doing the graphics of the New York Times. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, it was a very exciting first year for me, and I learned quite a lot. And we did a lot of graphics and. Um, like some of uh, World Cup stuff, um, airplane, tragic airplane stories, um, inner American migration. I had, there was Senate and House elections in November. I did some cartograms, some weird 3D renderings for on oil drilling um, and animated cars, world clouds, more plane crashes, a 3D chart. And while I was looking at this, uh, I, was sudden, I suddenly realized that some of the stuff I made is pretty like, much the opposite of what I told you like two years ago. Um, so um, it's kind of weird. I tell you all this stuff and suddenly I'm in a newsroom and the first thing I do is like I break all the rules. So I thought um, I owe you an explanation um, and we need to talk about that. Uh, why is it suddenly okay for me to, to use 3D charts and all this stuff um, that's considered to be dangerous? Um, so this is a... Um, an alternative title for this presentation, um, know the rules and then break them. Um, so the rules make sense, but um, uh, they shouldn't be taken too, too, uh, too seriously. Um, so first of all, why, uh, why do we need to break the rules at all? Um, why, why, why should we even try to do it? Because it's like dangerous and um, all the, the bar charts and, and the classic chart types are proven, like scientifically proven to be more accurate and um, all this stuff. So why, why should we bother with other types? Um, this is my short answer. I love graphics. Um, and without breaking the rules, uh, many of the stuff that I wanted to make would not be possible. Um, here's another answer that might come shocking to you, but bar charts are boring. Um, so um, they are efficient, and they are useful, and everyone knows how to read them. And we should, use, we should definitely use them a lot, so I don't contradict what I said yesterday. <laughs> but they are still boring. Um, some of you might say, I don't care. Um, I'm, like, I'm a journalist, I do news, I, do, I don't do entertainment. Like, why, why should my stuff be exciting and not, and, and not boring? And that's okay most of the time, but uh, you're not the only one making graphics. Um, in fact, there are now more charts and infographics uh, produced than ever, and many people are making graphics, and there's some comp so there's some competition. Um, and making the most boring charts possible is not, might not play to your advantage in this like, race for attention. Um, and also, um, there's not just humans making graphics. Uh, we also see uh, more and more graphics created automatically. So Google has uh, added a tool to the search. I don't know if, you, if you've seen it. So if you like search for internet usage in Nigeria, you get this chart for free. Just with a search result, and it's an inductive chart, you can hover over it and see the individual values. Um, so, it's, that's even more competition, and uh, 
Google and Microsoft started playing with live election results. Um, and so, you, so I expect a lot of more of these like auto, uh, automated charting. Um, so the point is to stay com competitive with all these charts and auto-generated charts. Uh, we have to be able to think outside of the box of these standard charts. Um, here's another way to put it. Uh, my former colleague, John Niedermeyer, um, said this in his farewell speech a few weeks ago. Um, there are now a million information sources out there, so the effectiveness and the imp impact of good journalism depends on the form we give it. Um, and some might disagree with the sentence and say like the content matters most and um, people don't care how we like how good our site looks like or the templates. Um, but I would I, I think sometimes you need to deal, do a little bit more than um, than just like having the most awesome writing uh, or the most awesome data um, to to raise above the competition. Um, so. Now that we all agree that we can do better than just bar charts all the time, um, what, is the, what is the thing that is missing in our like, uh, list of requirements for graphics? So we want them to be effective and simple and easy to understand. Um, so what, 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 am, what are we missing? Uh, what is the secret sauce of the nice graphics that we make at the New York Times? Um, so I imagine at this point you must be very curious to hear the answer. So I added this little like drum roll to hold back a few, hold it back a few seconds. Um, it's joy. Um, when when you hear like in our department, when you hear a graphic described as enjoyable, that usually means that you're on the right track. Um, readers want to enjoy looking at graphics, and they are more likely to share graphics that they enjoyed looking at. Um, so the question is, what makes a graphic enjoyable? Um, and how can we achieve this? Um, let's first look at some things that definitely make a graphic less enjoyable. Um, so if, if, if missing, um, so we all have some basic sense, uh, some basic taste for design, even if we're not a designer. So when something looks horribly designed, we all kind of, uh, it's, we agree it's harder to enjoy because we think, oh my God, this is ugly. Like there's a blue background and the yellow font. And um, so um, these design is not our main focus, but we essentially want to get it out of the way. So people don't care about the design. They think it's okay and, um, and they can enjoy the content. And also readers should be able to read the graphic without thinking too much and without uh, having to like read the fine print somewhere. And some of the stuff I talked about yesterday, like uh, annotating the charts. Um, so yeah, we, we, need, we need to cover that, but there's more we need to think about, such as um, the more that makes the graphic enjoyable, such as humor. Um, so we are, all, we are all human beings and we, we like to be amused. Um, here's a, a study about the jealousy in dogs that was published in, in June last year. Um, so this was a, a scientific experiment. Dog owners were given a stuffed uh, animal, uh, a stuffed toy dog and they were playing with it while their real dogs were watching them, and they were like tr tracking the reactions of the dog. So how do they react when you like play? Are they envy or are they jealous um, or they don't care? Um, and this is one of the watchers they published with the story. Um, and it's kind of a, a, one, a very fun story, and it, um, this is the most boring uh, way to present the results. This is how most uh, scientific studies are publishing their results. Um, I don't know if, if you see the result. Um, so there, the groups are different uh, reactions of the dog, such as barking or pushing, touching, um, tail up. Um, so one of my um, colleague, colleagues, um, Jennifer Daniels, tried to make uh, this a little more enjoyable, and she made this chart. So it's the same chart, but it added uh, like nicer annotations, and we have like for each of the reactions for the dog, she made a little illustration. I think it's her own dog that she was just drawing. Um, and I don't know if Tufty would say this is chart drunk. Um, maybe, maybe he would, but um, I definitely love the dogs, and I think it makes the, the entire thing, like it's not a super serious story. Um, why, why shouldn't we add like a, a cute little dog to, to the bottom of it? Um, so this is my example for, for humorous graphics. Another quality that makes graphics enjoyable is novelty. Um, many people like stuff that is new, and um, repeating the same form over and over again gets boring. 
So yeah, why not do something new? Um, it, it makes me sad. Every election in Germany, I see like the same charts published and they're like, even made by the same uh, um, press agency and they, like all the sites just, like I frame the same widget. Um, so so why, I can't believe that this hasn't changed like over the last eight years. Um, And there's one factor that should make us strive for novelty, um, and that's the dramatic evolution of technology. Um, so outside of this conference, um, the internet is faster and more available than ever um, in any places. Uh, we have faster computers, we have web, better web browsers, we have new devices, tablets, smartphones. Now we got these tiny watches and we need to think about them. Um, we got HoloLenses coming up, so this is a, a an actual um, part of, my, of Microsoft presenting their new operating system, so they imagine something like that, those experiences for Windows 10. Um, so we definitely need to innovate the content along with, uh, uh, with the evolution of the medium we are publishing in. So this involves risk taking and we need to break the rules. Uh, then there's complexity. The world we live in is very complex and all the, all the things we write about um, such as economy, politics, foreign policy, conflicts, Middle East, environment, climate, social system, none of this is simple. Um, so while a good part of, of the job of a graphic editor is to make these complex things look simple and easy to understand, um, this simplicity comes at a cost in graphics. Um, so um, here's a chart of strikeouts in baseball shown as league averages over, over time. For each year you have an average, so in, 20, uh, in 1924 it was at 2.7 strikeouts an, an average per season, and in, in 2012 it was 7.5. So the story is there on the rise. Um, by showing aver the average instead of the individual data points, we emphasize on the, on the bigger trend, um, but we, we lose some interesting detail. So this is the way we, we published it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an older story. Um, but I think it's way more enjoyable with all the strikeouts per game in the chart. I don't know if you, if you can see the dots. Um, and also, um, this allows us to, to highlight individual teams in here, which, uh, which makes it easier for readers to connect with the chart. Like there was a, 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 a search box where they can just like look, look at their team and then uh, it would be highlighted so they can see like where their teams is in the chart. Also, um, yeah, we talked about this yesterday too. Uh, the world did not start to exist five years ago. Um, so it's always worth taking a look into a, like a longer history. And uh, there's a fascination coming from those long time series going back like 20, 50 years. So it's a rule of thumb, uh, adding more data um, ma can make a graphic more enjoyable. Um, and it also helps you to get, uh, make sure that the graphic is right. So if you just look at the five year trend, you might be losing, like, losing the bigger picture and giving like, a wrong or a false impression. And lastly, uh, maybe the most controversial points on my list, um, all, like, all the graphics we're doing are visual, so um, they have the potential to be also beautiful, um, like, like an artwork or an illustration. Um, so you might think that there's no clear rational value to beauty, um, but I would disagree. Um, first of all, people enjoy looking at beautiful things and uh, they catch our attention easily. Um, and we also like to share them with others. Um, but also beautiful representations um, tend to be easier to read and they make complicated things look more organized and, and simple. So now we have a problem. Um, these new goals that, that we added to the mix uh, kind of are in a, in a direct conflict to the, to the, other roles, uh, the other rules or the other goals that we have. So we want things to be simple and easy to understand, but we also want them to be complex and interesting, uh, revealing all the details. Um, we want them to be um, um, accurate, but we also want them to be fun. So this is kind of serious versus fun. So you, there's always this kind of tension between. And to, uh, to illustrate, uh, how this like feels in the in, in our day to day work? I, I brought three examples um, that I want to show you. Um, also, um, since this is like a long presentation, at the end you're probably all running away to to Pilhofer, um, which is fine. 
just one advice, you have to run early because if it's like the big keynote of the conference, uh, there will be like a long, long line from, from the like cathedral where this takes place to, I don't know, to the ice, <laughs> to the place where you can buy ice cream. Uh, so, um, so you might end up in a queue and not getting in. Um, the, the, first, the, the first example um, is a story we did in January this year. Um, what's in a street name? So the, the CEO of a, of a real estate website called Zillow, um, this is the website, um, um, contributed a piece for the Sunday Review, like our Sunday, Sunday paper. Um, and it's an excerpt of a book that he was publishing based on their database uh, of rents and property values, uh, Zillow statisticians um, did some research on the correlation of street names and home prices. Uh, for instance, they found out that just by knowing that someone lives on a street called Main Street, their home value is more likely to be 44% uh, less value than the average of all homes in America. So just someone tells you I live on Main Street and you know it's probably a shitty house. Uh, or it's not as. So they just found out by, uh, on this data. So they wrote this article about it. So it's kind of an uh, opinion Sunday piece. Um, and uh, they did not just give us the article or contribute the article, but they also agreed to provide some data. So that's what we are always looking for in the graphics. Um, we want some like real data, large databases, so we can look for interesting things. So they, so they did this. Um, they gave us a list of street names and the average, um, the number of homes and the average uh, home price on the street on like uh, for, each, for the United States and then for each state and for each county. So it was like a, uh, almost a gigabyte of data. Um, so one of the things that we like the first, when it first came to mind was like to have a little thing where people could just type in their own street and see uh, what's the, the value of their street. So for instance, if you live on Lincoln Place, your homes are, likely to be 66% more valuable than um, the average home. Um, but if you live on Sesame Street, that's the first thing that I tried out, um, your, uh, uh, your home, it's 7% it's less average. And then we had like a map showing where these streets are actually in, in, be found. So in some states there is no Sesame Street. Um, but this calculator did not provide like a way, the overall view of the data. So there's like this huge data set and we have this calculator that only shows like one, one street at a time. Um, so I was looking for, uh, uh, for an alternative. Also we needed some kind of print graphics so this calculator doesn't work in print. Um, so I started to, to look into the data. Um, yeah, one obvious list, uh, idea is, is to show a list of streets. Um, for instance, these are the, the most common streets in the in the in the co most common street names. So here's like sorted by the number of homes on the street. Yeah, this is really boring. Uh, Main Street, Second Street. It's it's kind of interesting, but once you once you thought about it, it's not really surprising because this is like the first street they built in all the all the all the towns, and then they like uh, lacking any creativity or I don't know. Um, they all named the streets by numbers and they started later with a more interesting street names. So, um, and the, the home values don't, don't really like, uh, there's no real um, um, variation in the, in the home value because this is just the most um, common street names. So um, another way to do it is to sort them by, by home value. So this is kind of like the most expensive streets to live on. Um, and the first one is Indian Creek Island Road. The problem with this is, uh, so like every, the average home value on Indian Creek Island Road is $21 million for one home. Um, and uh, sadly, there's not very many homes on this street. Um, so if you show, look at the number of homes, you see it's like 34 homes. So this is like one very expensive street with 34 homes on it. Otherwise, this same street name is not used anywhere. Um, so it's not very representative of the county, of the country. Um, I, I started looking for these streets, and if, in case you're curious, this is Indian Creek Island Road. <laughs> it's like this tiny island in Florida, um, and th there's only like these, these expensive mentions, like average home value, 22 million, uh, and, and the rest of it is golf courses. So you can play golf, you can hang out on the beach, and that's... Um, 
So I, I try to fix this problem with this like not representative streets by, by cutting it by a number of homes. Um, so say like I only include streets that have 1,000 homes on it. So then you get a more representative list. Um, but the problem with that, um, for, for one, you have like Central Park in there, and this is like three streets, like one is in Manhattan, and then you have like three other Central Parks in America. But it's still like 6,000, but is it really, really like, is this uh, uh, the best measure? And then also when you just change the cut a little bit, say like 2,000 instead of 1,000, this changes the list. So like, okay, this is a uh, minimum of 1,000 homes, and this is the minimum of, uh, of uh, 2,000 homes. It's a different list, so kind of I'm arbitrarily picking this, this cut and then I'm saying those are the most expensive streets. It's kind of not, uh, not a good way to, to do it. We try to avoid being like uh, hand-picking hand stuff. Um, so, um, so I went back to the most common street names and I thought maybe if I would just like extend the list, not just so the first, uh, 10, but the first 100, um, that could help me, but then there's a problem, like how you, how you get like 100 street names in a list. This is not really uh, easy to read. And then I was frustrated and, uh, and I was sitting in my kitchen on like a Sunday night and I was thinking about a word cloud. Um, and then this like big warning flag came up, like word clouds are considered harmful. Um, so why, why on earth would you use them? Um, And before I start bashing web clouds, um, let's talk about the good things, uh, like one of the good things uh, about this form. It's actually the only way you can encourage reading of a large number of words. Like a list or a table is not encouraging because you have to, you start at the top, you have to go down, and it's, it's boring. It takes a lot of sc screen, and, and word clouds compress this into a tight representation. And, um, by looking for, for like tiny spots, where could I fit the word need in, like in this tiny spot of Israel. Um, so that's the good thing, that's what I wanted. But there's a lot of problems with word clouds. One is the selection of words. So there usually word clouds are, uh, often we see word clouds being used for um, like someone made a speech, and this is like the words in the speech. Um, and then you got all kinds of, of, of words in there that have no real meaning to the story, like many, always, much, or point. Like We don't know if you hear the word point in what context this might have been used. Um, so you have the like meaningful words like Israel or nucle nuclear mixed with those uh, meaningless words. Um, so if you would make a table, you would not publish these words. You would, you would, you would think this is not a relevant piece of information. So why would you put them in, in the world cloud? Um, but still, this is one of the problems like it was being used all the time. The second problem is the words are scaled by word count. So just so the idea is the more often a word occurs in the speech, like the more relevant it is. But you don't know if the word has been used in, like aside from the problem that you have these like words that are like occurring all the time. And like if you would make a world cloud like like this, um, you would usually get like a big end and a big or as like the most uh, used words. And then there's a list of stop words that remove these words. But this again, like what is the word you cut out and where you draw the line? Um, so the problem is just because a word is used more often in speech, you don't know that it's like more important. Also, they c the a word could be used in a joke or in a, like in a negative phrase, so you don't know if it's like pro pro-nuclear or, or anti-nuclear. So um, it's, kind of, it's kind of very messy. Um, the third problem is the use of random colors. So just to make it look more pretty um, or more distinguishable, like the words are colored in different colors, but this is not any meaningful category or anything. Um, so yeah, it's really not helping. Anyway, this was the bird cloud, the first one that I made in this, in my, sitting in my kitchen. Um, I tried to, to avoid these problems. Um, some of them are avoided by, this is not a speech, this is a data set of street names. So every word that's on the, on the word cloud is a, a, a piece of our database. It's not a, a random, it's not something that's just made to, to con, con, connect two sentences. Um, so the data points are meaningful and I don't scale them by word count but by home, number of homes. 
So the big, the, like the main streets and the numbered streets are bigger here. And I use color to highlight, I use, in the first version I use color to highlight the, the most expensive. So the darker it gets, the more expensive are the homes. So you see the, the bright ones like Main Street, Third Street uh, are, uh, are the, the less valuable. And then you have like the, the tiny, tiny streets like Ocean Boulevard and um, Ocean Drive in there that are like kind of pointing to, to, to a pattern. So that was starting to, make, to, to uh, look interesting. Um, but it's, it's, still, it's still a huge mess. Um, like you, you couldn't, we couldn't just like publish this. And I, I wasn't even like daring to show this to my colleagues. I showed it to one colleague um, and he, he liked it. But um, I tried, I still tried to find like a different, different solution. And then there's like street names, street values. There was one idea that was popping up uh, the Monopoly game. So here you, like the layer, the Monopoly game has like street names on this and street values kind of. So you have this rent. So it starts with a, um, I, sh I should have taken an Italian one. I, um, so it starts with a less valuable. Like you all played this game. Um, so I, so I tried. I, I, I thought of like maybe we could just make a make a Monopoly board that's actually based on actual uh, data, and we could even make like select your state and then you get your Monopoly game. But the problem with that is it's like a lot of copyrights on this game, and so we can only break the copyrights if there's a fair use uh, clause, if there's a fair case of fair use. So if we would make a story about Monopoly and like the, I don't know, the inventor of Monopoly dies or I don't know, uh, he's probably dead already. Um, uh, then, we could, then we could use the Monopoly game layout, which is copyrighted. Um, but this was not about Monopoly, this was about street value. So this is kind of, we, we asked our legal department and they said no. They better not do it. Um, so, um, I thought, like, what's the, what's the thing that I really like about the Monopoly game? And they've, actually, in this game, there's a solution for my problem with the uh, um, sorting of street names uh, by, uh, by, like, more relevant streets that have the most homes on them versus the more interesting streets that are the most valuable. So here we, you see the colors. Those are groups of streets. And there are, like, groups of, of the same value group, but the most... Uh, common streets, like the most recognizable streets of each of the groups. So you have the most recognizable rich streets and the most recognizable poor streets and like the uh, transition between them. So I kind of stole this idea and combined it with the word cloud and broke, um, broke the word clouds into, th uh, originally I had five, but then we added it down to three groups. So those are the, the bottom 40%. If like, if you would lay up all the street names by by street value, and you would take the bottom 40% by, by value. So those are the streets, the 40% the of the streets with the least valuable homes. And then you saw this chunk of it by number of homes. So that's kind of the idea. You look for each, for each home value segment, you look at the most valuable streets. So this is the, the bottom 40%, and you kind of see um, like the, the same thing in the, in the list, but added with some, some streets that are um, um, I should I should change to the to the thing. So this is how we publish it. So yeah, those are the bottom forty percent, and then I, I added this uh, like little tool that that points out a few of the streets. So those are all the numbered streets in there, and here you have the president names, which are also most common in this kind of sector or um, you see that most of these streets have the suffix street and avenue. Um, and then you, we're looking at the next 40%. And um, so those are like, like the middle class streets, if you would, say, if you would call it like that. And you see that you start to get more scenic street names in here. So like Park Avenue, Riverside, it kind of makes sense because if you have like a nice park, there's probably uh, uh, higher rents or higher values on the streets or Skyline, Sunset. And, and here, it's really not any scenic names. So to, 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 to I, what we needed to do is to classify the street names by, um, like to find out all the streets that are, um, that we consider a scenic street name. Um, and uh, also in this group, we have lots of trees and woods. So maple, uh, cedar, linden um, And then like the last thing was the top 20%. So like the, here's where the rich live, but it's not the, it's not 
insignificant because this is the top 20% of homes, actually. Uh, so it's a lot of homes in there. In my first layout, I had five things, and in each of the five panels, we had the same number of homes, um, just sorted, just the most valuable of them. Um, and uh, here, you see like the real scenic names, Atlantic, like everything that's that's close to the to the coast. Um, yeah, numbered streets. Uh, you still have number threes, but then the numbers get higher. This was one interesting chart I made. If you, make, if you, pl if you extract the street number, um, like the, the, if it's the second avenue, it would be the second, uh, number two. If you plot this number over the home wheel, you get kind of a, a correlation. So the, the later, uh, I think the explanation is the later a street gets built, like the better homes are on there. And um, so yeah, this was, uh, how, how, we, how we published it. Let me go back to my script. Yeah, um, said I always use the color to, to point someone because it's kind of hard to find, to navigate around. Um, so to make it easy, I use the red color. Um, now I'll move on to my thing. Again, if you have any questions um, while I'm drinking some water, I'm happy to answer. Um, if I if I find a way to make it work, um, um, and uh, and then I, s I also have to go through like my 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 bosses and like s present it to them and we talk about it and if they like it, then we do it. So the second example is about the three D chart, um, and it's a chart about. Um, yield curves. Um, who, who of you knows about what a yield curve is? We got one, two. Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty usual. This is a yield curve. Um, it shows uh, the um, the interest rates across. I have to read it because I ca I can't even remember it. Uh, it. Shows interest rates across different contract lengths. So, for instance, you you buy. Um, um, treasury funds, and then you have you can select between different products. You can you can buy ten years, and then like after ten years, you get your money back. And the interest rate is like uh, if you if you like if the interest rate is three percent, and you buy for hundred, you get hundred three back or something. Um, so um, this is this is the another chart of the yield curve. This is uh, every color is one product. Um, like the black, the black line is the 30 year, like the most long term um, investment that you can make. And it's plotted over time from 1990 to 2012. And it's really difficult to read. Um, but someone um, made a version of this five years ago and posted it on a popular financial blog, made a 3D version, probably using Excel or something. Um, and I think until that time, this chart got on the radar of, of one of my colleagues, Amanda Cox, with, with whom I made this graphic, and she was like always waiting for the right time when we would do a 3D yield curve. So I w w at some point I was, uh, I was uh, just finished with the graphic and I was looking for something new, and, and she said, Gregor, how about that? Um, um, and of course, I said, uh, I, I was thinking, oh my god, 3D charts, considered harmful. We, we, we could not use them, and that's what like, everyone thinks. And, uh, and um, and there are definitely problems with with three D charts. Um, the, the most common, the most problem is they're they're used when they're not needed. So like the the three D chart I burned in the beginning, there there's no three D data in here. There's no no reason to use the three D charts just because of uh, it looks pretty or anything, um, which it does not. Um, so so this is a problem, but in this case it was needed because we clearly have a 3D data set. Many times people, when they hear 3D, they think about like a physical object, like a map with heights on it. But this is three dimensional because you have three axes. You have the, the yield, um, you have the yield, um, like the 3% would be, would be there, the 30, 30, and then you have the different products on, on this one, and then you have the time when you buy on the long axis. Um, so in this case, it could work. Um, 
but there's lots of problems that, 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 that go with 3D, 3D charts as well. Um, one problem is that, like in the real world, when we, when we see 3D, we have a lot of things that help us to, to, to judge the, the, different, uh, the distance, so the depth of, of what we see. One is that we have, we have a pair of two eyes, so we get, kind of get a stereographic image, and which helps us. Also, we can move around, like even by moving like a little bit, we see how the, how the 3D world changes, and this helps us to see if this is like, um, it's, you, you may you may have seen, uh, seen like those uh, um, um, visual uh, illusions when when there's like a room that is looks like it's totally weird, but if you just move around, you see how it, how the trick works. Um, but in a in a static three three D chart, you can't really move around. So um, another problem is um, so this is like the first thing I rendered. Um, it is hard to to see the structure in it. Um, I try to add a profile line, which helps a little bit, um, and, and add the axis to it, to, to give it like a, a, a room, like, like I said yesterday, like a map where, it, where we can locate it. Um, but, um, and I, I, I tweaked the color change, the, the color scale, so you can see like the little, little spike that was like in the first version, it was all white. Um, but what really helped this chart was adding adding a grid to it, because this kind of because you know these lines are supposed to be straight, uh, and this helps your your brain decon deconstruct the three D image. Um, another problem with three D charts is that sometimes they use uh, you see them using the wrong perspective. So, for instance, if you look at the at the side of this chart in a perspective projection, which is like the the the, the usual one that's used. Um, like things in the front are bigger and things in the back are uh, smaller. Um, it's kind of not what you want because um, this makes the comparison um, of different products really, really hard. So um, in this graphic, I changed the projection. So when, you, when we have like a, a, a different views and when, you, when it comes to this view, I change from the perspective projection to the, like a two-dimensional di two projection. Um, so you can actually see the same chart, but in, in, in this kind of uh, view. Um, and we, we, we did not highlight all of the lines, but just like the, in this case, it was a 10-year treasury. Um, and then a big problem with 3D charts is that, or essentially with all the charts, like what am I looking at? Um, like probably the first time you see this yield curve, people were like, um, what is this? Um, so we needed, we needed to frame it in the right way. Um, I'm not super happy with the headline because it says we are predicting the future, but some of, some of our editors in the Upshot team, they like to make the headlines more dramatic um, so it gets more attention. Um, and, and yeah, we added all the copy and see, who of, who of you have seen this graphic and played with it? Okay, it's worth demoing it. So, so yeah, this is this is the the, the graphic online. Let me try to make it bigger. Um, so what what we did to to help readers to get this is we made this like slideshow, um, and when you go through the type slideshow, it changes like different viewports of it. Uh, it. It shows you different views of it and shows you like this is the long term rate. This is the this is uh, this is the short term rate. This is the long term rate. This was the the line like last Wednesday when we published, um, and then this here's this interesting value that that is, and then we explain why it's interesting because it's like the economic crisis that is the kind of visible in here. And so we we went through this chart. Um, my colleague Amanda Cox did all the writing and the research for it, so uh, she did us the credit. She's way more smart than than I am. Um, and I made sure that like this transition work, this is the view from, from top that kind of we just liked. <laughs> so the, the copy says here's the same view, view from above. Um, compared to what is, a diff is the important thing we talked about yesterday, so we, we, we compared it with different countries. So this, this were the yield curve in, in America and this is the yield curve in Germany. And you see that it's red and the red means that it's negative, which is kind of weird because it means you, you 
buy you buy a product and then you sell it after uh, 20 years and you get less money back. Yeah, so you, you buy German treasury bonds uh, and you get less money. Um, Ah, yeah. Uh, I, I hate this. Like in Chrome, when you use the, the, the arrow keys, it, it brings you to a different side. Oh, I'll continue. Okay, this is how I find my graphics. I go to my website and then I click here. San Galo has actually the, the best internet in the conference. Right? Um, anyway, I was, I, was, I was always almost too admitted. I think you get that. Um, you, if, you, if you're curious why the interest rates are red, look at the graphic. Um, so yeah, we did the storytelling. At the end of it, um, since we, we have this like crazy um, R and D department like on the twenty eighth floor, and they I heard they have a three D printer, I I printed out this curve so I can like have it in my hand and play with it, and it's kind of fun. Um, so here's the let me look at the clock. I'm good, pretty good on time. Here's the third example. Um, a record year for order records. I, I don't know who of you have followed, you probably all followed the story of like General Motors and Toyota in America. Um, they had to recall millions of, of cars because of um, parts were broken and actually they were broken for over a decade and people have died over the time and General Motors have like said, oh, it's not our fault. Um, so we get like crazy headlines over the year, like General Motors have fined and called a lawbreaker. And it wasn't just wasn't just General Motors, also Toyota. Um, so at the end of the year, after all this coverage, um, we had this kind of recap, um, recap um, like how the auto industry, like broader view, how the auto industry has changed, and um, like we, like we could have just just used the, an image of like a broken car or the lawyers and all this, but um, we wanted to do something. Um, a little bit more exciting. And here's the bar chart version. Um, the thing is that like never in history have like have the, the number of cars recalled over a year is like the most in history. So 62 million and this is like how my, not the number of cars that have been recalled uh, in past years. So essentially this bar chart tells the entire story. We could just say put this somewhere in the post. Um, but there's one problem with the 62 million, like whenever you have a value like 60 million, um, people don't know what it means. Like, is this a lot or is it not a lot? Obviously you have some context, it's, it's, it's more than ever, so it must be a lot, but how much is it really? Um, um, so to, to, to give a better sense, we, um, we researched like what's the number of cars on the street, um, the total number, so we can put it in, 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 in a ratio. So, and the ratio is one out of five. So, one out of five cars in, in American streets have been recalled. Um, so, how, how do you present that? Um, you could kind of make a pie chart, right? One fifth and then the rest is, but it's still boring. Um, it's, it's kind of, we wanted to do something that, that gives you the full magnitude. Like, even this is kind of okay, it's one car. One doesn't sound very much. Um, but this is kind of a way that you think of cars. Cars lined up in a street. Um, so what we did is, I'm just going to go to this thing. Um, so this is, it's cut off a little bit. This is the, the graphic. We made tiny cars going from left to right, like on a huge highway. It's not, the, the American highways are not far away from this. Um, I spent some time making sure that they don't collide and there are some, some, some cars want to go faster and they, they pass by. Um, so this was fun, like making a game. Um, and it, it's kind of distracting from the bar chart, so we made it like real gray. And the reason why we put it in here that we want to show like how many cars is this, like one out of uh, 62 million, how many is it? And 
and it's one out of four. And then you see like the magnitude. Like you can imagine this would be a street and you could just like, it's so many cars. Um, and yeah, we, we went through the same met metaphor and like showed, showed like breakdown by company, breakdown by, uh, by auto parts. Um, and yeah, it's kind of why would you do animated uh, cars? Um, and the reason why we did this is we, like the, 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 the entire story has been, has been published already. This, is, this was kind of a way to, to recap it and to, um, to draw some attention to it. This, this was kind of a goal of this graphic. Um, so yeah, um, that was the, the way we, we showed it on the homepage. We had, I'm pretty proud of this, we had actual moving cars on the, uh, I think I have it still here. Um, actual moving cars on the New York Times homepage and they leave it, left it on for like five hours or something because they give us the, it was uh, um, December 30th or something. And, and this is like, nobody cares about news. Like everyone is at home and so we wanna, wanna, wanna dr drive some attention to it. So this is kind of how we, how we presented it. And, um, and it worked out really well. Um, for this entire investigation, the, the Times got like a public service, service award last, uh, this year. And they mentioned the graphics too. I was happy about that. Um, so yeah, uh, if you wanna if you wanna uh, follow up the story, I highly recommend this. Um, uh, we have like a collection of all the all the coverage, and it's starting with, with the overview, and then you f you find like all the stories of people involved and the long silence. It's it's a very it's it's uh, very good. Okay. Um, Wow, I'm pretty fast. So you will have time to go to Aaron Pilhofer. <laughs> Here's my takeaway messages. Um, be brave. Um, don't rule out any visual form just because like someone on the internet doesn't like it. Um, and because maybe Edward Tufty would say it's shark drunk. Like, I still recommend reading the Tufty book. It's really good. But don't take it all too serious. Like, um, there will be critics, um, both inside and outside of your newsroom, um, so you should make yourself ready to take some risks. Um, and in DataViz, there's no rule without exceptions, so this is kind of how we handle it in, in our department. There are no dogmatic rules. We don't have like a, the people usually think we have like a design handbook or something because all the graphics look so, I don't know. Um, but we don't even have like, colors that we, that we are forced to use. We just have like fonts that we use, but the rest is all, there's no dogmatic rules. Um, and, and sometimes even chart drawing can be the right thing to do and to add to your chart, like with a, with a jealous dogs. Um, every story is different, every data set is unique, and uh, you can treat all the situations the same. So for instance, if the, if the auto recalls, like if you would have made a graphic right after some like tragic incident with auto, parts involved. Um, we would have, we would not have used like a, this fun cars moving around thing. This was just because it was the right, this was the right time to do it. Um, sometimes it's not the right time to do some stuff like this. Um, if you do a crazy thing, um, you should explore alternatives before you go crazy. Like you, you at some point you think, oh, maybe a workload thing, but still try to find something else, try to avoid it. Um, there might be a better way to do it. and. Um, and it's, it's always good to not try to fall in love with a particular form too early in the process. Um, this is, like in practice, this is really hard and it happens to me all the time uh, that, I, that I lose myself in one idea. Um, here's an example. We, I, we kind of, like there's a thing called Voronoi tree maps, but nobody ever before has made a Voronoi tree map inside of a map, so we kind of, <laughs> it's, it's weird, I know. Um, and I had this data set that was kind of an inviting me to do it. It was like migrations, like people from New York moving to Florida. And so I, tr I just tried to do this and I, and I tried really hard and I tried for like a week and um, there's lots of technical problems involved with it. Um, but in the end, uh, that was not the best way to publish uh, the data set. So, bef so we did not publish this in fir uh, the first place, um, but, but like a, a different view. Um, that is like just showing the, how this changed over time. Um, but yeah, since we already spent so much time with it, we published this like a few days later and 
for some reason, this drives a lot of traffic to, to I don't know why, but it drives a lot of traffic. And I'm, I'm feeling sad about it because I'm not super proud. Uh, I was at NICAR and there was like this five minute talks and someone uh, mentioned like when, sh when you not shoot maps um, in graphics and this was like the example. Um, so, um, so I, yeah, I felt that sorry, but, but um, to be fair, uh, the, she, she also mentioned that this is a better way to publish it. Um, so, but yeah, we decided to publish both because we, uh, this, is, this, is, this was published at the upshot and this is kind of a more uh, f f informal way to, to handle news stories. So we have more freedoms to do. Um, if you do, uh, if you know that you must do a crazy form, you, you need to be aware of the flaws. They are hated for a reason. Um, and you should find out what's, what is the bad parts and what's the good parts in it and um, find workarounds. So, um, yeah, you've seen examples of this in the, in the world cloud or in the 3D chart. Um, it, this involves some time and, um, and thinking. But then you should push hard to make it work. Um, there will be resistance, as I said, and you should like, insist on this form. Um, and yeah, it's a good way to ignore the critics after you publish, because you know, like you thought about this all the time. This is a bad idea to make a, bar ch to make a 3D chart. And then you think about tons of stuff and you spend a week on it and fine tune it and address all the problems. And then you publish it and someone will say, oh my God, a bar chart. Uh, uh, oh my God, a 3D chart. Um, so you will get some critic responses because you, you, you left the, the, comfort, the comfort zone of bar charts. Um, and yeah, this is, this is kind of heartbreaking to me, even though it is probably not um, meant so critical. Um, this is Ben Schneiderman. He's kind of the godfather of, of data vis. Um, he invented the Voronoi tree maps and all kinds of stuff. When I was studying data visualization, he was like the hero. He was presented as the hero. And he said it's a courageous use of 3D. Um, he was probably uh, more, more uh, distracted by the headline that like, it's not really predicting. Um, and yeah, thanks for trying. <laughs> um, yeah, you should ignore that. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, here's a, here's a quote of my boss that uh, he, he gave at South by Southwest a few weeks ago. Um, so many news graphics look like look all the same, like gray parking garages. So um, I'm very fortunate to work in a team that values um, uh, novelty and beauty and jo enjoyable graphics. Um, so thanks, and hit me if you have questions. Um, on, the, on the yield curve project, okay. I saw that and my first reaction was so cool and so scary. I, I don't know how to explore it. So I wanted to ask you, um, what kind of feedback did you get from people in the industry, people who know the subject matter really well? Um, they were all amazed by it. Um, like uh, like people working at, at Bloomberg Business Week got, got to us and they were like, oh my God, like why didn't we do this? And there's even like with, in this Bloomberg terminals, you can see, see a 3D version of the yield curve, but it looks so crap. Um, so um, they, they all liked it. And they, and they appreciated the fact that it, it was making something incredibly boring, uh, interesting to look at. And people got attention. This is probably the, the peak of attention the yield curves ever got. Um, <laughs> like in, in people outside of uh, hardcore economics. Uh, wait. Where's the mic? Um, I was wondering if you also did some A-B testing on your graphics and what did you test and what were the results of it? Um, so we, we usually we don't try out different forms before we publish. Um, but I did some A-B testing on, uh, like on minor things. So for instance, when we have a a graphic and there's like a button somewhere. And when you click this button, you see a second screen, like a second view on the data. 
like I was curious how many people are clicking this button. So I, I, I measured the click rate of the buttons and it was, it's usually very discouraging. That's why I stopped measuring click rates. It's like maybe 17% or 15% will click this button, like the other 85% will not see this, the second thing. Um, but then yeah, we, we tried to improve it and try different like layouts of buttons and then test it if, it's, if it would help. Or in one, in one graphic, um, one of our editors wanted, like you, you could hover the graphic like with a mouse and then you would see different things. And he would say, we should add a sentence, hover, hover over the graphic to see more. And like nine out of 10 uh, editors were like, no, we don't do this. We don't need this. People will know this. Everyone knows how to do it. And so, we, so we added a version with the sentence and one without it. And I think it was like one point something increase um, of like people hovering. So it's, but, but it's, so sometimes I do this, but it's, I try not to do it too much. Uh, so, right. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you know Dada Viz? And uh, what are your impression about the startup? It's about uh, data visualization and data journalism. Dada Viz. Dada, Dada Viz? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think Mirko showed it yesterday. Uh, I, I have not looked into it very much, but I think isn't it just like a collection of a lot of, a lot of charts that help you? Yeah, uh, a lot of charts daily, some from uh, crowd source, uh, from proposal, some from journalists, yeah. and it's just uh, the data journal and data visualization. It is start up around about uh, August last year. I think it's a useful thing if you, if you work on a graphic and you just want to get an overview what, or like what kinds of forms are out there. So it's, it's, I like these kinds of collections of, of graphics. So I can tell you're a little bit conflicted by the um, sort of clickbaity headline on the, on the old curve chart, which is one of my favorite charts of the past five years. I love that chart. Thank you. Um, but as you say, the geeks among us really love that chart, and we know exactly what it is. We don't need to be told what it is because we understand yield curves, and we love playing in with it, and you can click on it and rotate it and zoom in, and yeah. it's amazing. Um, and I was thinking about the principle that Jonah Peretti has at BuzzFeed, which is that he wants every story to reach exactly the people who would want to read that, reach that, read that story and not anyone else. And at the same time, in, in my company, and I know, and I guess maybe from what you're saying at yours as well, you get um, this pressure from editors to say, well, this is, this is all great, but how do we make this more interesting to more people? And so I, w I guess I want to ask you about that sort of tension. Do you try and take the data and make it as clear and as enjoyable as possible to the people who are really going to be interested in it and who want to consume it and explore it? Or do you feel like you've also got this mission to try and sort of Okay. There's sort of eat your greens thing to spr sprinkle some bacon on it and to make people want to eat it and make people interested even if they don't know what a yield curve is. So, so in general, I would, I would always try to make it enjoyable for the most, well, if, like this is what we, like what is our goal, that people see it and people can enjoy it. And we, the times, like unlike maybe the Wall Street Journal, uh, which has a, like a CEO kind of -ish, uh, reader base, like the times, tries to serve the general, like everyone. Um, even though there's like, I have, I have a hard time reading some of the headlines that we produce, but um, there's like no, 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 no concept of, of like addressing stuff for, um, it's more like we, we publish it and then sometimes we try to, um, to also find re relevant audiences who might have not found it otherwise. So uh, as I said yesterday, sometimes, or um, we like we would publish a story on something that happens in Brazil. So and we publish in English, and so sometimes we translate stuff and uh, uh, like um, um, promote it on like special br uh, like uh, uh, Spanish Facebook streams, or I don't know how they do it. But they, they try to target audience. They try to f t uh, find the right audience for the for the right pieces. But I would never like use this argument to narrow something down and say like, 
I don't want anyone to, I don't anyone but this group to see it. So I I want anyone because it's kind of what Okay. So thank you very much. Bye. Right. Now we can all run to Aaron. <laughs>